I was asked to think about or talk about um, how I think, if you will, uh, how practice may change over the next decade, specifically how um, we're going to assess kids that we think may or may not have sepsis. So um, I hope that what I'll show you is of interest and perhaps exciting. Uh, first, there's some disclosures. Um, some of the biomarker work that I'm going to speak with you about, um, <clears throat> my institution and I have uh, patent applications out there for, and there's also a, a new company launch being um, undertaken now uh, around these biomarkers. So I'm going to focus on three different areas. One is diagnost diagnostics, the other is stratification, and then phenotyping. And as we move along, I think it'll become clear what, what I mean by those different terms. So let's talk about diagnostics. Uh, this is a conundrum that we all face every day, not just in the ICU, but also in the emergency department and regular wards. So in other words, the kid who has fever and other signs of systemic inflammation, what we call SIRS, among those kids, who in, who's infected and who has sterile inflammation, right? This is a daily question. Hey, Sam, there you go. Um, it's a daily question for us. Um, and so my bias, if you will, is that perhaps biomarkers may have the potential to allow us to begin differentiating between these two types of patients. And when I think of biomarkers, and the way I'd prefer that you all think about it, is not so much of a dichotomous manner that yes, no, the patient is infected or not infected, but what the biomarkers allow us to do is sort of give you a risk estimate of how likely they may or may not be affected. And I think this is a very good way in general of how we should approach biomarkers. I think we're all looking for black and white yes and no. And that's not really realistic, I think. The way to think about these biomarkers is better estimating risk. And so probably the best example out there is procalcitonin that we have right now as a diagnostic biomarker. And I'd be curious to know by quick show of hands, how many of you are using procalcitonin in your respective hospitals? Yeah, so very few. It's really, it's really remarkable, right? It's, it's really, really remarkable. This has been available now for probably six, seven, eight, ten years, or probably a little bit longer in some other areas of the world. And the adoption has been very slow. Um, why is that? There's a lot of reasons for it, but one is that perhaps some of us are yet to be completely convinced, and others, it's just that adoption is slow. So whether or not procalcitonin is, is, is useful for our practice, I think is a matter of debate. This is a recent meta-analysis that shows you um, the odds ratios across a number of different, it's a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, and the odd diagnostic ratio is around 10, which is actually pretty reasonable for a diagnostic test. But some of you may say, well, that's not good enough for me. But I'm not here to debate procalcitonin. The point is, is that this is probably what's best out there. And as you see by a show of hands, we're not applying this. Uh, and what are the reasons for that? And one of those is that we're not convinced. So because of that lack of convincing, we've been trying to pursue this. And we recently described interleukin-27 as a potential novel diagnostic biomarker for sepsis. And the way we identified IL-27 was a very sort of discovery-oriented approach in which we sort of did a whole genome-wide screening. And this came up as a potential good predictor. We then went on and <clears throat> changed this to uh, going from mRNA to a protein. And if you measure IL-27 in the serum compartment, a level greater than 5 has 90% sensitivity and positive predictive value. So if this is true, if we can continue to show this, it may be a very good rule-in test. So in other words, if levels are high, you can be pretty convinced that one is infected. And importantly, and again, I'm not trying to compete with PCT, in these initial studies, IL-27 has outperformed PCT. And if we do sort of a combination of IL-27 and PCT, uh, it performs at either biomarker alone. Interestingly, we've done some recent studies in adults, and it doesn't seem to perform very well in adults. So imagine if that's true, that we, the pediatricians, have a biomarker that the adults can't use. It's usually the other way around, right? So wouldn't that be cool? And so if you actually look at IL-27 in kids with sepsis and adults with sepsis, what we show you here is that, in general, the kids have higher levels, and the dynamic range is much broader um, for, for IL-27. So, Again, <clears throat> perhaps interesting from a developmental biology standpoint that maybe this may be a, a biomarker that's more useful in kids and adults. 
Um, we've got some ongoing studies to try to validate this. Uh, there's protocols going on in the pediatric ED, the pediatric ICU, adult surgical ICU, and so forth. And I think that's important because biomarker performance really varies depending on, on the population. And one of the interesting things in some preliminary data involving <clears throat> a little over 133 kids, it's looking as if IL-27 is particularly good for identifying infection in kids with immune suppression. So there's the curve for IL-27 in black, for PCT in red, um, an AUC of 0.82, which for a clinical test is pretty reasonable. Um, and by what I mean by immune suppression here is very heterogeneous. These are kids who've had bone marrow transplantations, kids who've had liver transplantations, kids who have congenital forms of immune suppression, so a very heterogeneous group. So if this play, plays out to be true, it may be pretty exciting for, for this difficult population. There's many other um, <clears throat> uh, candidates that are out there. Here are four, and there's also about 175 other candidates that have been reported in literature, so it can be hard sometimes to wade through this literature. And so this leads to the idea that a, perhaps a combination of biomarkers may perform better than any one biomarker. And this was very nicely demonstrated by, by Jubot's group in France, uh, in which they developed a, a biOSCORE based on a combination of PCT, neutrophil CD64, and S-TREM, and they had that kind of performance. So an AUC of 0.97 in a derivation cohort and almost of 0.9 in an external validation cohort. So I think, my bias or my expectation or my prediction is that in the future it won't be just a single biomarker but a combination, if you will. And then the biomarkers are also going to help us perhaps to, to monitor therapeutic e efficacy. So in other words, temporal changes in biomarkers may allow us to detect whether we're appropriately treating patients or not. Uh, and this was demonstrated in this trial in adults in which they used a procalcitonin guided algorithm to initiate and or stop antibiotics and they were able to reduce reduce antibiotic days by a good four or five days. Unfortunately, the, the exciting results from this trial have not been replicated in other trials, but there's still promise there for, for using these as, um, as, as therapy monitors. And then there's a whole area of molecular diagnostics that I'm not going to get into too much, but these are sort of molecular-based assays that can detect bacterial DNA in clinical samples and clinical fluids. The current stuff that's out there still relies on a positive blood culture, okay? So you still have to have a positive blood culture, and then you test from that. But nonetheless, that cuts your detection time, including resistance data, by about 24 hours. So it's still very useful. The holy grail, though, is that there are several experimental techniques out there, including whole exome sequencing, that you can detect bacterial DNA directly from a blood sample. And that's, I think that's going to be the future, but that's going to present another problem, I think, because this is going to be perhaps too sensitive, right? Because some of us are going to have some bacterial DNA in our blood, but we're not really infected. But these tests will say that we have bacteria. So perhaps we're going to get into a problem where these assays are too sensitive, and then we may need to re-identify or redefine what it means to be infected, and perhaps biomarkers can help there. All right, so now turning to the idea of stratification. And so what, but this I mean, we spoke about this in a previous sec session. Um, what we mean by this in this context is being able to assess very early who's at risk for poor outcome uh, in kids with sepsis. In other words, within the first 24 hours. And so we've developed this biomarker-based model that we call Persevere, that based on a panel of biomarkers, we're able to um, um, assign a mortality probability to kids with septic shock. And importantly, these biomarkers were again selected objectively from extensive transcriptomic studies, and it's based on CART methodology. This is what the tree looks like. Um, it's a sort of a, a, a decision tree that gives you mortality estimates depending on where you end up along that tree. Um, so, for example, you have patients at the top, they're divided based on <clears throat> biomarkers, and they continue to divide until you get what are, to what are called terminal nodes. So if the kids end up in that terminal node based on that sequence of biomarker criteria, they have a very low mortality probability, whereas if they end up in that terminal node, they have a very high mortality probability. And so the way to read this tree is, again, not dichotomous yes, no, but mortality estimate. So if kids end up in those 
low-risk terminal nodes, uh, their mortality is 0 to 2.5 percent. Those are intermediate nodes, 18 to 26, and then those are the higher-risk nodes. And this is how the test characteristics work out. Um, separate derivation cohort, and the, the tree held up very, very nicely in a separate um, test cohort. And importantly, it outperforms PRISM-3. And, and, and I say that not because to beat my chest, it outperforms PRISM-3, but it's more that I think if, you, if you're going to design these things, they should perform better than what already exists, right? Otherwise, what's the point? Right, what's the point of having a fancy biomarker test to predict outcome if you can just do it with PRISM-3? So that's really the point there is that it outperforms PRISM-3. And if you're interested, those are the papers. And then so what, right? Why, who cares? And, and so I think that, that knowing baseline mortality probability, whether it be for sepsis or for any other thing that we do in the ICU, I think it's absolutely fundamental for clinical practice and research. It can allow us to stratify for clinical trials. It can inform decision making in certain settings, allocating resources, a quality metric, in other words, is a benchmark for outcomes, and also risk stratified um, analysis of clinical data. And we showed some examples of that in the previous session, if you were there. And then finally, the issue of phenotyping. And so what I mean by phenotyping is what kind of sepsis does my patient have, okay? And if you think about it, we already do this, right? So we think about we have microbiologic phenotyping, gram-negative versus gram-positive, and that's very important. It dictates our antibiotics. Warm shock versus cold shock, if you like those terms or don't, but you know what I mean by that, right? And that also dictates how we <clears throat> adjust our, our, um, <clears throat> our cardiovascular medications and our, and our approach to cardiovascular physiology. Endocrine-based phenotyping, relative adrenal insufficiency versus a normal HPA axis. It turns out that this is probably not that useful, but that's for another topic, okay? But the point is that we already do this. What I think we're going to need to get to is biological phenotyping, meaning what is my patient's response to, se response to sepsis and how does that response, how may that inform what we do? And so we're taking a number of approaches, and what I want to show you right now is, is this concept of sept septic shock as a syndrome, and, and if you accept that it's a syndrome, that perhaps there are subclasses of septic shock, and that perhaps those subclasses have distinct gene expression patterns that lead to distinct phenotypes, and way back when we asked the question, can this sort of genome-wide transcriptomics, can it allow us to identify subclasses? And the short answer is yes. We identified subclasses of kids with sepsis, uh, based on differential gene expression of over 8,000 genes. And that's all well and good, and I can do a lot of fancy things on my computer, but it doesn't get us to a clinical test. And so we'll get to that in a second. And then one of the nice things is that after we, after we identify these subclasses based on gene expression, we said, okay, they're, they're different based on gene expression, but are they different clinically? And so one of the subclasses that we call subclass A, for lack of a better term, are sicker, have higher rates of organ failure, and have about three times the mortality of the baseline. Okay, so pretty interesting. So we've now evaluated over 300 patients with the goal, again, of getting to a clinical test, all right, because we can't do 8,000 genes in a timely manner in the context of the ICU. So one of the things we did is that, again, through bioinformatics, we reduced that gene signature to 100 genes. That's more manageable. And then we also are expressing these genes with something, with something called JEDI, the Gene Expression Dynamics Inspector, that sort of gives you a global picture of, of gene expression. It allows you to look at gene expression and compare patients just based on intuitive pattern recognition. So on the left is normal, on the right is cancer, and without knowing the genes, you can say, yeah, those, those look different. And then we're also using a, <clears throat> a digital quantification platform for RNA, which is pretty neat. It's, it's based on standard hybridization. It has capture and reporter probes. It doesn't require amplification like PCR. It can be done in solution phase. Uh, and it gives you a digital readout of mRNA abundance. Again, so getting to more, be more clinically feasible. With, with the right resources, you can turn this assay around in about eight to 10 hours. So getting a little bit closer to our time constraints in the ICU. So this is what subclass A and subclass B looks like, okay? Again, without knowing the genes, you can say, yeah, those, those kids are very different. 
And so we've done this with separate der derivation and test cohorts, and over and over again, we see that the subclass A patients are younger, sicker, and have worse outcomes. And if we do logistic regression in which we adjust for illness severity, age, and comorbidity, allocation to subclass A is, is associated with almost three times the risk of dying, okay, independent. And it's interesting that subclass A kids have actually have less comorbidity, all right? I haven't even told you what the genes are, right? So what are the genes? So the genes that enable that subclassification correspond to adaptive immunity and the glucocorticoid receptor signaling pathway, okay? Adaptive immunity, glucocorticoid receptor signaling pathway. And these genes are repressed in the subclass A patients, all right, relative to subclass B. So if this is true, it has major theranostic implications. And theranostics means that a diagnostic test can dictate therapy, right? So many of us are talking about now, you'll see here at this meeting, the use of adjunctive therapies for sepsis to enhance immunity, right? The focus is changing. If that's gonna work, and if this is true, you can say, well, these, kid, these two classes of kids are gonna respond very, very differently to that, and perhaps the, the group A kids are the ones that really warrant enhancing therapies for immunity because their adaptive immunity genes are repressed. And then steroids, okay? It's embarrassing that in 2014, we're still debating steroids, and we were, there's even, I'm even doing a session on Saturday about steroids, but nonetheless, Subclass A kids have repression of all of the glucocorticoid receptor-related genes, so you would think that they would have a different response to steroids, and we were actually able to look at this in a post hoc manner, and it turns out that the use of corticosteroids is associated with four times the risk of dying in the subclass A patients. So again, if this is true, you can see if you're doing a glucocorticoid uh, or a steroid study in kids with sepsis, and if this is true, this is a major confounder, right? You would not want to have the subclass A patients in your study. All right, so how will we assess patients in the future? Improved diagnostics, who's infected and who is not, and I think the future for that is biomarkers coupled with molecular diagnostics. Improved monitoring for therapeutic efficacy. Is my patient responding uh, appropriately or do I need to change my therapy? Uh, and then stratification, who's at risk for doing well with standard care and you should just leave them alone and not put them in a clinical trial? And who is destined to do poorly and perhaps those who is who we should be um, selecting? In other words, more rational conduct of trials. And then finally, biological phenotype. In other words, what is my patient's biological response to sepsis and how may that change and improve um, how I'm going to approach them? So that's my view of the future. I may be wrong, we'll see. But in any case, these are the various centers that uh, have contributed to um, our database over the last decade or so. Very, very grateful to them. Um, these are the people in my lab, um, the NIH for funding us, and thank you for listening.